All right, folks, lesson uh, unit three on uh, active versus passive transport. Just think about it. Make sure you know those terms in general. Active to be active doing anything means you're using energy. Um, to be passive means you're just kind of doing nothing. All right. So some important vocabulary for this section. You need to know diffusion and osmosis, concentration gradient, which we've talked about that in diffusion before, passive transport, something new called facilitated diffusion, so active transport. And then sodium potassium pump endocytosis and exocytosis that's our goal to know those words for today all right now osmosis right now i'm going to start here first by talking about diffusion diffusion is the movement of dissolved particles and they go from areas of high to low concentration uh, it could be salts it could be any type of sugar it could be glucose fructose maltose dextrose or it could be like the sucrose that you see in this image above now what you see here, and you will see this in the future, because this is a way scientists represent what's inside a cell versus outside of a cell. They'll have one side of a beaker and then it'll be divided in the middle from the other side of the beaker with this thing called a, a permeable membrane. Now, what that means is things can pass through it, right? Like an air filter or a filter in your home in your AC unit. It allows the air to pass through, but not dirt and pet hair and things like that. Um, a sponge is semi-permeable. Water can go through, but large things cannot. And you'll see these sucrose molecules are actually very large. And typically they would diffuse from this right side to the left side where, there, where there's an area of low concentration of sucrose. But since these particles are so large, they can't pass through. So in an effort to balance this out or to dilute the concentration of sucrose on this side, water will move from the right side to the left side excuse me from the left side to the right side right and you can see that there's a higher concentration of these water molecules over here than there is concentration of water molecules over here so osmosis which is the movement of water actually will typically go in the opposite direction that diffusion would have went see diffusion of these sucrose molecules would have went right to left Therefore, osmosis will go left to right. All right. So osmosis is the movement of water molecules, and it is from high concentration of water to low concentration of water. So both osmosis and diffusion move things from high to low concentration. The difference is in diffusion is the movement of the dissolved particles. In osmosis, it's the movement of the water. All right. Now, what controls osmosis? Well, the same thing that controlled diffusion. You have to have a concentration gradient. There has to be an area of high concentration of dissolved particles or water, and then an area of low concentration. If you have the separation of those concentrations, then you have a concentration gradient. All right, now, with being water in, and particles being able to move in and out of cells, what happens when water moves in cells? We know what happens when particles move in. Our body will use them to make energy or, or for whatever it needs to build, whatever protein or whatever. But what happens when water moves in cells, right? Think about like a water balloon. Now, all cells can shrink or shrivel up. That water balloon can shrink or shrivel up if you let water out of it. So if water leaves a cell, it might look like a plant wilting. And that is typically when water is leaving that cell by osmosis. That could happen in a very hot climate. Y'all know how plants get hot and they, they their water evaporates from them by transpiration and the plant will get wilted, right? Typically, you have equal amount of water moving in and out. That should be a balanced situation. But now if water is moving into the cell, it can cause that cell to swell up. And this thing called a vacuole will actually look larger. But now if water is leaving the cell, that vacuole that stores water will actually get much smaller. Right. And, I, and, and, and well, things can become dehydrated. You'll hear about that phrase later. Matter of fact, it comes up really, really soon. There's two situations that pop up that will cause water to move that you will see on the EOC and you have to be able to tell what would happen with each one. Now, the, you've got putting fresh water something in salt water and then putting salt water something in fresh water. And then how will the cells react? OK, I want you to imagine a bucket full of water and a water balloon full of water. That's the easiest way to learn this stuff. So if you put a fresh water cell and I want you to imagine that being the water balloon into a bucket of salt water 
Now this cell, this water balloon would be fresh water. It would have no salt in it. But that bucket from the ocean would have plenty of salt in it. If you put this balloon in that bucket, that salt from the water in the bucket is actually going to start to diffuse through the rubber that is the balloon and into the balloon because it's trying to balance out. They want to be equal with each other. Um, they're trying to reach homeostasis, I guess you could say. But anyway, the salt would move in that balloon and water would move out of that balloon, right? So that would actually cause that balloon to shrink or shrivel up. On the other side of the equation, you can put a salt water something in fresh water. So imagine this balloon's got ocean water in it, and then that bucket is full of water that you just got out of the hose pipe outside, which is not going to have hardly any salt in it at all. Um, so you take that balloon full of ocean water, put it in that bucket of tap water. There's more salt in the water in this balloon than there is in that bucket water. So salt would actually start to move out of the balloon. That's diffusion. That means water would move in the balloon and it could potentially spill and burst. But you do need to remember only an animal cell can burst. Um, plant cells will not burst because they have a cell wall, which is this outer extra layer that prevents them from bursting. All right. And that would be bad. Um, because that, if your red blood cells burst, your red blood cells actually carry oxygen throughout your body. And if your red blood cells burst, then you would not be able to carry oxygen to all of the places that you needed it. And I don't know, that could be a problem. I think y'all know at this point that would be a major problem. All right, so you got putting a fresh water in salt water and then a salt water in fresh water. All right, two different situations there. Now, to categorize all of these types of transport is either passive or active, okay? Passive transport is defined by three things. One, it moves anything from high to low concentration. It requires no energy or no ATP, and it goes with the concentration gradient, which means it's just simply going from high concentration to low concentration. So that's three things. Now, diffusion, which is the movement of these particles from areas of high concentration that you see it goes to all these areas of low concentration, that natural spreading out diffusion, is passive transport. Osmosis, since it moves from areas of high concentration of water to low concentration of water, since it's still moving from high to low, it is still considered to be passive. And then you have this one other type called facilitated diffusion, right? Now, typically, just FYI, when you move in a cell, you move through this thing called a plasma membrane. And it's this green part here that's made up of all these tails and heads, right? Little circular heads. Now, typically, either osmosis or diffusion will go straight through the middle. It'll go straight through that plasma membrane uh, because those particles are so small, right? But sometimes you have to move large particles through the plasma membrane to move them from outside to inside of a cell. And it needs to go through a, a membrane protein that might have a big channel or helps carry it from one side to the other. If it needs a little bit of help like this protein, Right. The word facilitate means to help. Um, so if you can understand that facilitate means that it's diffusion that needed help, then you should be OK. Right. But just make sure you know it uses these membrane proteins to help move those things from high to low concentration. So those are your three types of passive transport. Active transport is defined by the opposite three things. Active transport moves any movement of molecules from low to high concentration. It does require a molecule of energy called ATP, and it goes against the concentration gradient. That means it's moving things from low to high. Your biggest example is the sodium potassium pump and then endocytosis and exocytosis. Now, don't let this sodium potassium pump here overwhelm you. It's not that difficult. Uh, your body is constantly pumping sodium ions and potassium ions in and out of your muscle cells. Sodium is moving out, potassium is moving in. Your body does this because it's part of your muscles contracting and relaxing and doing work. All right. Now, so sodium is constantly pumped out of your cells. You should be able to know that because your, your sweat tastes soggy. Potassium is constantly being pumped in your cells. When you have a lack of potassium in your cells, it causes muscle cramps. And that's why, you know, tr athletic trainers or whoever will tell you to eat a banana because it's high in potassium then that, that banana gets digested in your stomach. 
the potassium is absorbed by your small and large intestines, goes into your bloodstream. It's high in concentration in your bloodstream, right? Or it's not in a high concentration, but it's in a low concentration in your bloodstream, right? Because you just ate and it pumps that potassium into your muscle cells. That is an example of active transport because it is going from areas of low concentration to high because your body naturally has a high concentration of potassium inside your muscle cells already. There's another question that pops up on the EOC and it talks about nutrients in the soil, right? And a plant is continually taking up those nutrients from the soil into the roots of the plant. And do, do remember this because this is the EOC question. Um, you have to think over time, eventually there would be very little nutrients in the roots or in the soil because that plant took them all up. But still that plant will continue to pump those nutrients into its roots. And it does so by the process of active transport because it's moving those nutrients from areas of low concentration in the soil to where it's already highly concentrated in the roots and maybe even in the stem of that plant. All right. So that's two examples of active transport. Now your third and fourth, these are simple. Sometimes particles are so large they can't go through a membrane protein. They just literally have to be eaten or engulfed or taken in. It's almost like the plasma membrane. You can see it over here on the left. Plasma membrane almost folds in and becomes like a little food package inside of a cell. And then what it'll do is it'll digest that and send it to wherever in the cell that it needs. Okay. But anytime you take in large particles, that's endocytosis. And you should know the prefix endo means in. And if you can figure that out, you can figure out exocytosis means getting rid of large particles. And it kind of looks like this. You have these waste particles. They just are delivered by some type of little vesicle, a little smaller piece of the plasma membrane. And then what will happen is this vesicle will open up, sort of fold into the, the plasma membrane. It's almost like it just becomes a part of it. It's almost like Play-Doh. Um, and then expels those waste particles outside the cell. All right. So let's review over these vocabulary words real quick, make sure we got the general idea. Diffusion is the movement of dissolved particles, anything dissolved in water um, from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And anytime you have an area of high concentration to low concentration, you have a concentration gradient. Now, osmosis is the movement of water molecules from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And typically, osmosis goes the opposite direction of diffusion. So if salt's moving in, water's moving out. If salt's moving out, water's moving in. Now, both of those are examples of passive transport. And it's easy for them to occur because, to occur because they're small molecules and they can just pass right through that little plasma membrane easily. But sometimes particles are maybe say a medium size, right? And they need a little bit of help getting through. Still moving those particles from high to low concentration. Still requires no energy and still going with the concentration gradient, but you just need that little bit of help from that protein, right? That would be called facilitated diffusion. Now, those are all your passive transports. Your other side of the coin is active transport. Active transport is moving things from low to high. It does require energy or ATP, and it goes against the concentration gradient. And a key word to remember there is pump. You know, think about the pumping of a bicycle tire or a basketball or soccer ball. All of that requires energy for you to pump anything up. Uh, so that should trigger something in your mind. Then also think about, think about that continual uptake of nutrients from the roots of a plant and how it continues to pump nutrients from low to high concentration in the roots. And then finally, the super large particles that either have to be eaten by a cell or ingested, that is endocytosis and exocytosis. Now, again, this material from today will not be on your test tomorrow, but pretty much, oh, excuse me, everything else before it will be.